So one of the pleasures of being married to a veterinarian is the recognition that I am somewhat comfortable answering questions about uh, our veterinary brethren's questions, but for the most part I defer those to my colleagues who are better equipped. And both Jennifer and Brian did a phenomenal job describing the life cycle of the tick, the enzootic uh, cycle, as well as the risk factors associated with animal infection. But for those of you who've had Lyme disease and know that there is no recurrent immunity born of infection, you're all very concerned about how do I get this disease, how do I prevent it from recurring, and what is the incidence, amongst other questions, of reinfection, is there lasting immunity post-infection, questions of the sort. And we're faced with this all the time when making decisions about treatment. And equally as important is the issue of how do I know that I have Lyme disease? How do you know that you have Lyme disease? Anybody? Well, you'd like to have a 24 to 48 hour tick bite or attachment time, which ensures that the organism will migrate through the mouth parts, to the mouth parts of the tick. You'd also like to have a positive rash, erythema chronica migrans. We'll look at that in a moment. Short of that, how do you know you have the disease? We do blood testing, and the blood testing is often very useful uh, in making a decision about treatment particularly when you have a first approximation test called the ELISA, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, and if that's positive and the clinical suspicion is high, you're not compelled as a clinician to go to the next step, which is the Western blot. But the Western blot is confirmatory, and we'll talk about these things. Most importantly, if you have the concern that you have a big effusion in a large weight-bearing joint, a big swollen knee, for an example, is that grounds enough to treat for Lyme? These are some of the questions that come up all the time. How do you know you have the disease? Are you in the right area to acquire disease? Do you need to go through the blood tests to be treated for the disease? Can we bypass the obligate diagnostics to get right to the therapeutic phase of the treatment algorithm? And finally, what's the incidence of persistence of disease amongst those who've been appropriately treated? These are questions that come up to us all the time. And for those of you who refer patients or are patients or have been seen as patients, and know how devastating this disease can be, we're now getting more and more convinced that Lyme disease is an epidemic. It's moved into this area from the south, we think. Uh, there's a lot of interest in understanding how the epidemiology has progressed over the years. And I just make reference because of time constraints. The historical perspective is important. When I was a house officer at Yale in the 1980s, Alan Steer and Steve Maloista described this remarkable epidemic of people with this funny rash, this red rash with central clearing, and sometimes a bullseye in the middle, who may or may not have reported tick attachment, but when searching for a reason to explain a rash, fever, shaking chills, very nonspecific, then followed months, weeks to months after, by aches and pains in joints. And that would then progress to a frank effusion, a big, swollen, large, weight-bearing joint, typically a knee, sometimes an ankle. And these are big problems for patients. What if it's not Lyme? What if a young children who can't be treated with doxycycline? What if, in fact, it's something like ehrlichiosis or babesiosis, which may not respond to the therapies that Lyme disease responds to? These are all issues that have been tackled over the years, and we're, we're now much more comfortable in our understanding of Lyme disease and how it's spread, how it's treated, and how to prevent, if not diagnose, and then treat subsequent reinfection. So with that, those introductory statements made, uh, I'm not going to spend much time talking about the epidemiology of Lyme, other than to say that in my day as a house officer, this organism was called, the tick was called Ixodes damini. It's now called Ixodes scapularis. My understanding is it's the same organism, the same tick. I like the first name better. Uh, you've seen the pictures. I'm not going to belabor the point. These are small guys going from right to left, larval, nymphal, adult, female, adult, male. and. Uh, as you've seen, the risk factors associated with certain epidemiologies are very clear cut. If you are a hiker, a camper, a fisherman, a hunter, you're exposed. There is no doubt that certain epidemiologies put you at risk and be aware of that because that is one of the key elements of this discussion is how to prevent disease from occurring as opposed to how to treat it once established. The clinical manifestations of Lyme are variable. And it used to be we were very dogmatic about how you would think about this. If you had early Lyme disease, you'd have a fever, shaking chills, and you'd behave like you had any kind of infectious process, and you'd be over it relatively quickly within 24 to 48 hours. If you had an attached tick which was engorged and it was big, like the tick you saw in the scalp, that wasn't the scalp, it was the body, I'm assuming, of that animal 
uh, back of the neck and the nape of the neck. Well, obviously it takes a while to get from the foot to the nape of the neck, but this is where we tend to see them. If they're getting up that far, then you know that they've had a long time to travel. And it's in the tick's best interest to not be picked off and killed by you, so you don't know when you're being bitten. So interestingly, there are elements in the saliva which prevent recognition. A mosquito, by contrast, bites and you feel it, and you swat at it and you kill it. But the time of transmission is a big deal in this disease, and that's why it's important to be prophylacting against acquiring infection as opposed to treating it once established. In the subacute phase of disease, you've been exposed, you've been bitten, the organism is circulating through the body. One then begins to develop some interesting features, and one of them is a Bell's palsy, where you actually have a slight paralysis of one side of the face. Has anyone had Bell's palsy? Not fun. People look at you like, what's wrong? Have you had a stroke? It tends to go away, and that's the good news. It goes away a little bit quicker if you're treated, and we'll talk about treatment options. Uh, and then things are pretty much at baseline for a period of months, and it may be months to years before you begin to develop sequelae, the big clinical features of Lyme disease that everyone is fearful about, and that includes arthritis, where you have a big, hot, swollen joint. It may not take months, it may be weeks. We recently had the pleasure of seeing a young man from Keene Valley who came in with a big, swollen knee. We tapped the joint, sent the, the synovial fluid out for analysis, polymerase chain reaction, all of his blood tests came back positive, which was confirmatory, and we treated him with oral antibiotics, and he's now symptom-free. Thank goodness. But PCR on joint fluid is a way of amplifying the DNA of the organism, Borrelia, in an effort to make the diagnosis. And for research purposes, it's actually quite, quite compelling. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Salati, will be addressing some of these issues, no doubt, uh, in the next part of this, uh, this talk. In the chronic or latent persistent phase of Lyme disease, which can be months to years, people about, oh, it's, it's hard to judge because the data is not, is not crystal clear on this, but what proportion of people have been exposed and not treated, untreated Lyme patients will go on to develop cardiac arrhythmias? It's uncertain, but a fair percentage, perhaps 15%. What percent will develop arthritis? More than that, 20, perhaps 25% of untreated Lyme patients will develop a joint effusion and recurrent effusions, which may involve other joints as well. And finally, what proportion of patients go on to develop end-stage neurologic symptoms, which may include encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, meninges, meningeal inflammation, followed by true frank uh, encephalitis. That's not known, but these are very, very compelling presentations of disease, and you don't want to be one of those folks at all. And finally, what proportion of patients who are appropriately treated will still develop end-stage disease manifestations, disseminated manifestations. We don't have that data yet. So could one then argue, if in the right epidemiology, and we know that there are a proportion of ticks, we're trying to be as scientific about this, that are uh, infected and potential, serve as potential vectors of disease for you, could you, on the basis of a tick bite, treat without diagnostic assessment? Remembering that it takes a couple of weeks to seroconvert, why not treat early? The Infectious Disease Society of America would suggest otherwise, that you really want to be clear, crystal clear as to what it is you're treating, mostly because of the downside of giving antibiotics to people who don't need them. But be aware that if you are infected and untreated, your risk of major organ involvement is significant. So ticks must have been feeding for at least 24, if not 48 hours. The rash may develop in perhaps 30% of patients. Only 30%. That's not a high percentage. So you can't base your treatment decisions on the presence or absence of ECM erythema chronica migraines. Uh, without treatment, the rash will clear, and about 50% of patients describe a flu-like illness. In dissemination, as we talked about, it takes a while for this disease to take hold and affect major organs. In uh, those who develop a Bell's palsy, that can occur early or late. It's not the classic men meningeal sign, but it's certainly one of the features that has you thinking about Lyme early. If your, person, if your patient comes in complaining of these symptoms, I gather in dogs we don't see Bell's palsy. Veterinarians, is that correct? Not usually. No Bell's in dogs. But here's Bell's in a person. And in this young guy, you can see the left side of his face is, is paretic. His lip is not down. He's trying to raise his eyebrow, but he can't on the left side. And this is what a Bell's looks like. And it will resolve on its own. Uh, but again, if untreated, this disease can become quite dire. All right. So. 
what then can we say about the, uh, the folks who develop big time end organ disease? They're sick. And patients who have Lyme disease, which has gone unrecognized and therefore untreated, who present with encephalitis. One of the first things to think about is Lyme. And in the treatment of these patients, you must think about a lumbar puncture looking for cerebral spinal fluid, which may be infected. Very important that you don't just ascribe this to a other autoimmune disease like lupus with cerebritis or an infectious process that causes central nervous system involvement. Memory loss, fatigue, commonplace. Why then, doctor, don't we have fibromyalgia to think about? Well, we do. It's an extraordinary phenomenon that patients are referred in with the assumption that they have fatigue, diffuse aches and pains, their memory is impacted, their sleep is poor, they're having cognitive impairment. Shouldn't this person be on Celexa or Cymbalta and an steroidal? Don't miss thinking about Lyme disease. Indolent Lyme can present just like any nonspecific, quote, somatoform disorder, including fibromyalgia. Best you think about it before you pay the price with a undiagnosed encephalitis. So again, these very didactic uh, criteria that you must be in the first stage to have a rash, the second stage to have early neurologic symptoms, and third stage to have late neurologic symptoms is falling a bit by the wayside in that we're seeing people who may have some, quote, late disseminated features early on in the course of their illness. Here's the rash. You see the red band on the outside, central clearing. This is one presentation. Here's another. And this is an antibiotic study in which uh, one was making certain that patients had the classic rash. And if you look carefully, you'll see that you've got a red rash, which is annular. It's, circle, it's circular. And there's a bump in the middle. That's the bullseye. And there you have it. But again, you can't depend upon it. But if you saw it, and it was in the Adirondacks, and it was some young kid who was on a three-day hiking trip in Keene Valley, doing the gothics and came down to see you before you had a big swollen joint or a Bell's palsy, would you treat? Well, these are the kinds of questions that we're asked all the time. So I think that we're getting smarter about understanding this disease. We're getting smarter about intervening early. We don't yet have advisories, uh, but we're helping to form them as we get more intelligent about Lyme disease and its clinical manifestations. And we ask that you think hard to prevent the acquisition of this disease by being by being careful about your footwear primarily and also being on the surveillance for Lyme ticks, Ixodes scapularis ticks as you go through your day. Can we see them in, in the winter months? I guess you crash through the ice and are, are tooling around, you can, you can hit, hit up their little houses and <laughs> get exposed. I've not heard that much, but it's an interesting concept. So I'll reserve questions for the, uh, the question period and we'll take a break now, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm available for questioning of, of any stripe. Thank you so much.